So today I'm going to do a tutorial video on automation, just in terms of how to get your first company started. It will be mostly aimed towards people that haven't played the game before or haven't played the game a lot. But I think even if you have played it, this is one of those games that's so complex and it's so deep that you can always basically see new things that you haven't uh, really noticed before. And uh, yeah, this is something that sits at the top of my Steam playlist in terms of playtime and by a pretty big margin. I've had it since before it was launched on Steam, so I actually originally bought it on the developer's website. It can be, so I think it's on a 15% sale right now, but you can buy this game at full price and it is 100% worth it just because there is so much uh, depth and complexity to the game. But uh, that also cuts both ways. It's one of the reasons with the way it's been developed over time with the engine designer, the car designer, and just everything that there is in the campaign. Uh, it, can, it can be a lot of information to take in. So first thing, definitely Gazmia as the easiest uh, region to play in, just because generally the budgets there are quite big. You've got uh, sort of a big buyer base for some of the more expensive cars and just for uh, the cars in general, actually. Uh, and they're not that concerned about things such as fuel economy. Uh, so it makes it a little bit easier for you and gives you a few more options in terms of designing cars. Uh, we will just go for one of the preset names here. So I just spent a bit of time going through the random names and we're going to be the Castelli Motor Company, if that is how it's pronounced. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is the starting here. And again, if you're a little bit new to the game, it's actually quite difficult starting out in 1946 just because cars were so different back then. And it's, it's especially difficult if you're going to go for something like a bigger engine setup because you just don't have good ways of getting the power down. So uh, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't start in that year. It's just if you're new to, uh, to the game, it's maybe easier to go for something like the 1970s, even before, but we're just going to start in 1970 in this case. Then in terms of the preset um, on the difficulty of the game, Definitely, if you're brand new to the game, go for casual. It gives you a lot more starting money and it will make your cars a lot more competitive, even if they're not that efficiently designed. Uh, so that can make a pretty big difference. And as I said, this game is really deep and really complex. So that gives you a chance to sort of get to know how everything works. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to move it up to medium to make it a little bit more interesting. And we'll start from here. Right, so we'll start immediately with a new car uh, project and we'll start from scratch. Again, if you're new, you can use the generation tool. It is really cool that they've included that as an option. But what I want to talk about is the different options. And the reason why I think a sports car is a good option to start with is because it's just a little bit easier to balance than some of the other cars. So if you look at something like family and you can see there's a big opportunity here in terms of the sort of the, the market that's available to sell to family buyers. If you look at the demographic desires, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's important within this segment. So drivability is very important. Practicality is important. Uh, comfort's important. Prestige is important. So is safety. So is reliability. And to a certain extent, so is fuel economy. And of course, you're not just going to want to focus on this segment. You're probably going to want to focus on some of the segments around this. So the thing is to balance all of this, you really have to balance well the engineering time of the car, the production units in terms of how long it takes to produce a car. And that's just not a very easy place to start. The nice thing about the sports cars are that you can basically most important here is the drivability and the sportiness of the cars. Yes, you know, this comfort and, uh, and safety is a little bit important. You can get away without having those really good, but it's not very difficult to design a car that's safe. And prestige is also important, but if you have a big engine, you have a fast car, you'll probably have that anyway. So it's a little bit easier to balance. And the one thing that's really key here is if you look at the budgets um, for different cars. So family cars, you're at about 13,500. For sports car, it's at 24,000. So it's a lot higher. And that also just makes your life easier because if you've designed a car that isn't that cheap uh, to sell, that's just going to make it a little bit easier because you can sell at higher margins than you would be able to have the family car. You don't have to be that efficient. Uh, I think the other thing is uh, also in terms of just the production units, 
you don't have to be that efficient in terms of the production units because if you make lower volumes you can just sell them at higher margins which goes back to the price as well so yeah so basically this is what we're going to aim for and we'll probably sort of bleed into some of these other uh, demographics as well as they start to develop but um, for now we'll we'll try to stick to the sports car Okay, so let's have a look in terms of the body types. Uh, let's just eliminate a couple of things that we'll definitely not be looking at. No SUVs, uh, no wagons. So I think within this, we will find something that is fine. And I think we're just going to go for this design. This should be fine. We can do a convertible as well if we want to. Now, in terms of the base of the car, uh, I'm not going to go for aluminium or anything like that. We will put a powerful engine into this. And by the way, every single thing that you select here, you have to always look at the engineering time relative to the benefit that you can get out of something. So if we were to go for aluminium here, it doesn't actually cost us more engineering time, uh, but it can pr reduce our production efficiency. And that could be worth it with sports cars for sure. Uh, but in this case, I'm not going to go for it because we'll have a powerful engine, um, especially for the 70s. So we don't really need the car to be that light. Um, right so for the design of the chassis in this case i'm going to go for the space frame this is going to save us a lot of engineering time so later on you know when we've got when we're a bit more established and we've got some time to develop a new car we'll probably go for uh, the monocoque but for now space frame should be fine um i think steel is fine here right so in terms of the engine placement now again if you're starting out if you have something like a front engine car uh, you can use the front longitudinal just to get a nice rear wheel drive front engine car. That's pretty easy to balance in terms of the suspension setup and the relationship between the, the tire sizes and all of that. So that's a good place to start. You can make really, of course, you can make really good mid and rear engine cars. And we can get to that later on as to why that can be good and in what ways it's good. But we're going to keep it simple for now. The one place where I am going to spend a bit of uh, engineering time is on the suspension. So double wishbone, definitely, that's going to cost you about twice the engineering time it would be to take some of the, the less complex systems, but it can make a big difference in terms of the handling of the car. And this is the one place where we'll, we'll spend a little bit. Okay, so now getting into the engine. Uh, I am just going to go for a V8 setup here. We'll... Now, again, we have the option of doing uh, aluminium here, and we'd need the aluminium foundry, but we're going to make a powerful engine. It doesn't need to be light uh, necessarily. We'll go for overhead cam. So, by the way, you can make something like a dual overhead cam with a lot of valves, but uh, and that will make it easier for you to have something that is potentially very high revving. If we're going to do a four liter V8, especially in the 70s, I don't think we're going to need to make this particularly high revving. We'll, we'll have more than enough power. So um, so we'll stick to cast iron head as well. You can switch off the, this front wheel drive uh, option. This engine would be too big if you wanted to make it front wheel drive, but we're not going to make it front wheel drive. It will be rear wheel drive, so we won't have any issues in terms of the size of the engine. We can see it's still a little bit on the um, could be a, an issue if, in terms of height if it was four by four but again we're not going to do that so right we can move on from this so this will be the base of the engine and if we create just different variants of this engine every variant will start on this base as you go into the next screen this is where you can basically create the variant so there could be smaller variants of this engine that we create in the future um, the other thing this is very important for the, the crank, the conrods, and the pistons, unless you have a reason to create something like forged pistons, definitely don't do that with your first car, especially if your budget's limited. The thing is that something like having lightweight forged uh, conrods and the forged pistons, if you're going to have a really high revving engine, that could be useful. But if you don't have it, you could just be, uh, let's just look at the difference here. So you could just be wasting some engineering time. And very importantly, you're going to have to build forge works in order to, uh, to produce this engine. And if you're strapped for cash at the beginning, which you won't be if you plan an easy setting, but you will be if you plan some of the harder settings, 
um, that could you know put you in a really difficult position you're building something that you really don't need uh, so we'll just keep it there for now uh, camp profile we'll start this off on like maybe 70 um, because we probably want this to have a lot of power towards the top end Compression's probably going to be too much, but I'll leave it there for now. We'll adjust it once uh, sort of everything's set up with the engine. Uh, we're only going to have mechanical in injection now, so I'm going to go for a carburetor system. Um, now, okay. If we do two barrel, let's see how this works out. No, actually, we may want to just go straight to DCOE system with a twin carb and a performance intake. Um, as far as I know, this is probably one of the worst in terms of fuel efficiency, but the good thing is we're playing in Gasmia, so that's not really going to matter, especially within the, the sports car segment. So this will still sell well. Uh, and I'm going to go for the regular fuel type. So this is definitely going to make the compression a problem because, um, of course, the, the higher the octane, um, the higher compression ratio you can run. But uh, I just want to start with the regular because I know eventually the leaded fuels get banned and we're just going to, we'll increase the fuel mixture, we'll make this richer and this will allow us to run a higher compression ratio. So RPM limit, let's increase that a little bit. Exhaust. Uh, so here again, you can probably save. I think check what you actually need in terms of is it causing restriction in the uh, in the engine. Don't take anything more than you require because it's not always a good thing. Um, it can save some weight, but not a whole lot. But you really just want to see if you know if it causes any restrictions in terms of the flow. We'll have dual exhaust. Uh, you don't need a first muffler on a sports car. Um, only use the first muffler if you're building something like a luxury car and you want to have say two reverse flow mufflers just to bring down the engine noise but we'll just have one straight through and okay so we do have a knocking problem intakes valves exhaust all seems to be fine for now but let's get rid of some of this compression just bring it so you can see here we just need to get this octane or you can look on this little output screen to below 91 and then we won't have a uh, problem with knock. So we've got about 190 kilowatts, uh, which is a lot for a car in the 1970s. Uh, that's plenty. So, okay, let's just see what else we need to adjust here. I think I'm fairly okay with how this turned out. Uh, I don't think we needed to be able to run at higher RPMs. So there is some restriction being caused by the header. Let's see what it does if I move this up. Gets us another six kilowatts for another four engineering time, which I don't think is really worth it. Also, all of this stuff, we can just create a new variant of this and we can bring these little upgrades to the engine. You can do that later on. So let's leave it like this for now and just have a listen to what this sounds like. Okay. So I think we're all good here. We'll just see, is there anything I want to change? No, I think the rest is all good. This will be a pretty decent engine for a sports car and we will very creatively name this the V, or we'll just call it a four liter. Actually, we'll call it a V8 because we could have different variants of this. Um, there we go. And this will be the four liter sport. Right, so I will go for the coupe body design here. I'm not going to design the body, uh, first of all, because I don't want to make this video too long. And secondly, because I'm not very good at doing that. So I'll probably end up ruining this, uh, this nice looking shape of this car. So we'll just go for some, some wheels on this and that should be fine i'll stick to the red as well for the sports car so we're going to have it as a rear wheel drive definitely manual uh, i think we'll do a five speed uh usually it is worth it to have the extra engineering time in here and we'll get the top speed up to 
what the estimated top speed is going to be. That's not always correct, by the way. Uh, gear spacing. So because this is producing quite a bit of power, um, unless we have really wide tires, I think we could have an issue with wheel spin, and this could help that. So this is going to make your gear ratios closer towards the top end, which is good for a sports car. And it'll also make it a little bit longer at the bottom end, which means that it's going to be less likely to have wheel spin. We'll have an open div. And okay, definitely radial, definitely we'll go for sports compounds here. Uh, we'll make the, the rear tires a little bit wider. So if you're designing cars, this is something I didn't know when I started playing uh, this game. And you need to constantly look at that relationship between under and oversteer, and you don't want the car to have terminal oversteer. So I'll, I'll show you how to check for that in a minute if you don't know yet. But the easiest way to fix that balance is with the relationship between the size of the rear tires and the size of the front tires. So what generally happens is if you don't have enough grip in the rear relative to the front, uh, that can cause the car to have terminal oversteer where it sort of constantly wants to lose the, the rear end of the car. This is less of a problem in a front engine car. The further back you move the engine, the more likely that's going to be the case. So especially if you're putting the engine over the rear axle, like a 911, uh, then you are very likely going to have that problem. You're probably going to want quite wide tires in the rear relative to the front. Here, I think because it's front engine, we can do something like a 225 to 205. That should be OK. We'll do 15 inch um, just to get some bigger brakes in there and alloy uh, rims and okay so we're definitely going to have solid disc brakes and we'll make these quite big and the rear will do the same now this is something else that's interesting so one of the big benefits of having a rear engine car is it actually distributes the braking load better because in a car like this because a lot of the weight's going to be up front it means that the front uh, tires and brakes are going to work a lot harder in terms of slowing the car down compared to the rear tires. Uh, but we'll sort of balance this out once we can see exactly what the grip levels are relative to the brake force that we have. Um, no under tray. I'm going to give it four seats. Uh, that's just going to make it a bit more versatile. We might get some other segments buying into this as well, because people liking sports cars could buy it, but also somebody that wants something that uh, is a bit more practical um we will go for the premium interior i'll see how it works out in terms of the total engineering time but we'll do a standard am radio instead of the premium one and no power steering for now as safety since it takes the same amount of engineering time we might as well go for the standard 60s and instead of the standard 50s and I don't know if this makes any difference in terms of the actual safety, but we'll just go for that anyway. Uh, standard springs. Mm, no, I think that it is probably worth having the three extra engineering time spent on the gas monotube. Let's just see how much of a difference it makes on the sport rating. Uh, it's not very big, actually. Could save time here and bring the bitter dampers later on. I think maybe let's try to do that just to save engineering time somewhere. And we'll go for the sport preset. Now, this is what I'm talking about. So basically, uh, you can see that this car does not have the problem with, basically, if this line that's dropping off over here is going in the other direction, that means you've got a problem with terminal oversteer. And that will significantly reduce the rating of the car because it, it makes it a lot less drivable. But in this car, we're already sort of sorted out. We can play around with the camber a bit to see if we can get it um, a little bit more towards the oversteer side here. Let me just see. Uh, actually, if we reduce the camber on the rear wheels, that should reduce the grip on the rear wheels, which will increase your sportiness rating. You can see here because we're um, making it a little bit more sporty and less drivable, but we're not sacrificing too much drivability. You can kind of keep doing that until we essentially have no camber on the rear tires. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't like running camber if I don't have to. I don't know to what extent. It doesn't seem to 
doesn't seem to affect the servicing costs. In real life, of course, the more camber you have on a tire, the it's going to wear uneven, and that'll reduce the, the tire life. But um, I think we can keep the camber on the front tires. I uh, just want to see. Yeah, let's get the same damper stiffness here. Sway bars. I don't know. We can't mess with this too much. You can sort of tweak it and see if it makes any difference. In this case, we can reduce the stiffness of the... Oh, no, we can't actually do this too much either. We'll, we'll just keep it around this range. Generally, um, if you have a good setup, you can just play around with it and see what it does to these values. That is not... If you're going to export your car and drive it in Beam NG Drive, uh, this isn't the best way to set it up because I'm really just sort of gaming it a bit to see what the best ratings are that I can get. But um, that's not necessarily going to translate into the best car in Beam NG Drive, I think. At least that's been my experience. Uh, so let's just go through everything else again and see if there's anything else we need to change here. So there is a bit of wheel spin. Um, I'll see if there's a different way for us to get rid of that. Although we already have a sports compound tire here. Uh, let's look at the brakes. Brake force is not enough in the front, so we're on about 136. If I take this up to two pistons, okay, that definitely does increase the rating. Um, yeah, so we'll just do that. We'll have big brakes, two pistons in the front. Uh, let's see if it helps if I reduce the size in the back. That actually helps the drivability. Um, I'm not 100% sure why this is the case, but in reality, your brake force should only be about what the grip of the tires can, can take. Um, and so we can get away with reducing this a little bit. I'm not going to reduce it too much. Um, yeah, because I think we're fine anyway in terms of the rating of this car. Uh, okay, the wheel spin. Let's see if I change the spacing here some more. And I keep bringing that down. Oh, that's actually, it's not helping the rating much. It can have a bit of wheel spin. So the way I think this is meant to work, and again, this might not translate if you uh, export this into Beam NG Drive, but the wheel spin doesn't uh, refer to the wheel spin you're going to get if you rev up the car and you drop the clutch. It's more talking about the fact that even if you just pull away normally, um, you may have some wheel spin in the first gear or in the first gears. So this really can heavily reduce the drivability of the car because, of course, if this number is very high, it means that you basically can't pull away without having the wheel spin uh, problem. Yeah, so I think that's fine. I mean, this is a pretty good index rating. Um, and we'll have a look at how much this will end up costing, although I don't think this, these are the material costs, but of course, we still have to take into account the rest of the cost to, to get this produced. Um, but yeah, this is our first sports car designed and this should sell fairly well if we can get it produced uh, quickly enough. But before we get to that, let's just go to the test track and see how fast this goes around. So we'll just have a quick listen To hear what it sounds like and then I'm just going to skip the rest of the track so that we can just see. So it's about a 1 minute 28 which I think should be pretty good for a 70s car. Um, not that that's what it gets measured on, it gets uh, measured across all of these different uh, stats that we have for the car and you can go into the detail here to really understand so you know for example that sportiness is important and you can really see how each of these elements are contributing or detracting from that spend a lot of time here. Again, in the interest of time, I don't want to spend too much time going through this today. So uh, the next step is basically going to be for us to, uh, well, I guess give this a name and then get this produced. So, okay, uh, in terms of, let's just see, we'll just call this the, the Raptor. We'll call it the sport. If, if we have any like a race variant or a uh, convertible version, we'll, we'll change that to something else. And 
yeah, I think this is all fine. Okay, so now uh, we are not going to create different trims of this, so I don't need to clone the car for now. We'll go straight into the factory designer. Um, so this will be our first car factory. And medium should be fine. Uh, I'm not going to experiment with bigger ones for right now because we first want to see how this sells. Um, it says no mass production. Okay, so the reason why I can't mass produce this is because I've used, because of the chassis that I used. So this is a space frame, um, but that's okay. It's saving us engineering time. And as I said, we can go for the different setups later on. So something you want to consider here is QA testing and uh, maintenance. So the QA testing will reduce the slowdown that you'll have uh, as a result of, um, you know, just uh, issues potentially with the car. Maintenance will make your factories last longer. I really like this. This is a good one to have because that reduces the frequency of what you need to sort of update the car and retool the factories but it's 120 million, we've only got 500. So we may not want to take that risk right now. Uh, yeah, so we'll leave it as is. Okay, so on the standard setup here, we're going to get about 1,600 units produced uh, per month. Uh, we'll see, we just need to balance that against what we're doing on the engine side as well. So, okay, let's see automation, tooling quality. We may want to think about increasing that QA threshold because we will potentially suffer some recalls here, especially in the early years. Um, later on, this is less of a problem. But uh, I just want to see if we increase the automation, that'll bring down the number that we're producing. I don't think there's a big benefit in doing this right now. Let's leave it where it is. Um, increased tooling quality will make the tooling last longer because the, especially with the minor tooling, that will uh, deteriorate a lot faster than everything else. Um, but I think we're just gonna go for the standard setup for now. We can maybe tweak it later. So we need to aim for about 1,600. Um, now this is super important. So the most important thing here is, and this is where you have to really look at what every demographic uh, values before you start designing the car. Because much like in real life, when it comes to something like sports cars, so if I had to compare this to say a family car, with a family car, reliability is gonna be very important. With a sports car, it's not actually that important. So you can get away with having a car that's a lot less reliable. And if you want to really just save on the time that it takes to design this, you can just bring the slider down. You can bring it down by a lot. The reality is even if you have this big reliability penalty, uh, it's a sports car. People will still buy it in that demographic. So that's something that's important to keep in mind. But let's start, uh, let's aim for about 60 months. So this is the number that you want to be looking at. And I think that should be fine. I mean, that's a decent uh, design time. That's usually more or less what I aim for. And we'll see how we do on the engine and if we'll come back and adjust this a bit. So I think this is okay for now. We need to set up the engine factory as well. And... Okay, so there's nothing we need to change here. Again, these are going to be quite expensive, so we'll not build the maintenance and the QA testing facilities just yet. Okay, this factory can actually produce 2,900. So the car is a lot more, it's taking a lot more production units right now. The engine's not very complicated to produce. Uh, I think it's fine in this case. Um, ideally, we should see if we can produce more cars then, but then we don't know if we can sell them yet. And especially when you're starting out, you don't really have a lot of awareness in the market. So you want to sort of build that first before you start producing cars on a, on a big scale. So, yeah, we don't have to worry too much about things like um, automation here. But the, the good thing is, since we have lots of engines to spare effectively, we can increase the QA threshold and just really reduce our risk here of having uh, having recalls. I mean, I could probably go as far, let me just see what this does. 
So the one thing that we do need to keep an eye on is the cost per unit, um, which as we're increasing the QA, QA threshold, that will increase. So I'm going to take it up to about 90% in this case. Right. Okay, now engineering time. This is taking a lot more time to engineer. And this is where we can take advantage of having a, a less reliable engine to start with. So this is something else you can do. You can just, you, um, you don't want to put too many parts into the car that's going to take a lot of time to engineer. If you're designing a sports cars and supercars, even though you want something that's cutting edge, what's going to end up happening is that in the time it takes you to engineer that car, your competitors will engineer and release and sell cars before you can even get yours to market. And that's why you always have to balance engineering time with the tech that you're putting into the car. It's much better to try and save time by either bringing those updates later. So you do updates to the car just so that you can get something out in the market and then later bringing some updates. And in those updates, you can increase the reliability of the car at the same time as well. Um, but as I said, if this is a sports car, it's not that important that it's reliable. So, uh, so I think we're fine here. So this is 61.4. We'll match the car's engineering time to that. So this is all fine. Uh, let's go back to this and get this to about 61.1, give it a little bit of extra reliability for the car itself. Okay, now, um, what's going on here is that uh, I'm not going to go through everything that uh, you can do in terms of the forecasting screen. I think the most important ones are, uh, should you have things such as the factory cost or the tooling cost in the forecast projection or the engineering cost? Now, generally, I think it's fair to exclude the cost of the factory, because especially when you're setting up your first factory, um, and especially if you don't have factories, that's going to be a huge cost. It's very unlikely that the sales of the car is going to balance out that cost. Uh, with the tooling cost, well, you know, tooling and engineering cost, you have to do that with every design. So the car should sort of be able to pay that back. Um, and here you can uh, increase or decrease the minimum vehicle margin. So automatically the game will sell the car at a higher margin if you get to a point where the demand exceeds the supply. Uh, but you can adjust this to, uh, to try and see if it's possible for you to get profit in this case. But of course, the higher this price uh, is, the less likely you are going to be to make a lot of sales. And generally for my first car, the goal isn't to be profitable. The goal is to start increasing your market awareness. So you just want to get this car sold at cost. And even though you're making a loss because this is the first car that you're engineering and it's the first time that you're tooling the factory and all of these things, that's okay because you're just getting set up for success later on in the game. So I think that we'll, we'll probably do the second car design in a separate window, but this is actually okay. Don't worry too much about the losses that you're going to take on this car because uh, a couple of months after it is launched, we can just do an update to the car and that one, once we have a little bit of awareness, will be more likely to be profitable. So, okay, so I think this is all fine. The engineering time is more or less the same. The time that it takes the factories to uh, get ready in terms of tooling is the same, but it doesn't matter because this is much shorter than the engineering time anyway. And we're not using the factories for anything right now. If you're already using the factories, then these seven months that it will take to get them ready, you won't be able to produce whatever you're currently producing. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit later on, but our design is effectively finished. Deactivate the loan if you have enough money to just pay for this, and we do have enough money, so we'll deactivate the loan. And I think we can just go ahead and sign off the projects now. So here we go. So we are going to take about um, just over four years to get this out to market, uh, and we're going to go ahead and do that. So we'll skip all the way over. All right, so we're just about to launch here with our first car. Uh, so we've spent uh, quite a bit of money. Um, we've lost about half of the 500 million that we've started with. But 
Let's see. So uh, first thing you need to know here is that this will give you an idea of how much stock you've built up. And you can actually adjust how much stock you, you want to aim for to keep in reserve. This is useful if you're going to design a new car and you just want to make sure that you save up enough stock to keep selling. Uh, the other thing that we should probably look at right now is the marketing and dealerships. So let's get ourselves going uh, in terms of the other markets as well. So we're going to spend a bit of money. Okay, that's maybe a bit too much, but we'll spend a bit of money in these markets so that we can sell here as well. And then I think let's focus on uh, maybe sportiness and prestige for Gasmia. And reputation is more about reliability. We don't care so much about that, but maybe again, prestige. So this is going to be, we're spending quite a bit on marketing, but usually that does pay off in the long term. Um, let's just have a look for these markets as well. We'll do something similar. It's actually a lot less expensive here. Which makes sense because it is kind of tied to the country itself, the income levels and the population that you're advertising towards and as it is in real life as well. Uh, yeah, I think this is okay for now to just get some awareness out there and then we'll go back to the hub, just see how we're doing here. We'll kind of go until the end of 75 before we produce our next variant of this car. So we're not quite getting to profitable levels on this car yet, but as I said, a lot of this is just down to, so if you go to your um, actually, let's click over here and you look at your market awareness. This is one of the big reasons. So across these markets, uh, I think for Gasmia, it might be a little bit higher because we started here, but, um, your market awareness is quite low and this will increase every month. So you can see in the muscle category, it's going up by a thousand percent. Um, and the sports category, it's also so rapidly we're gaining market awareness. And this is why I said, don't worry too much about having the first car be profitable. As long as you are not completely spending all of your money, if you've got some reserves, uh, you just want to get that market awareness going. So we'll, we'll keep going here for a bit. But it's good. We're selling more units every month and eventually we are going to get to a stage where we can profitably sell these. I, I could probably just leave it now. I think we will automatically. So you can already see uh, we're starting to sell this um, at a little bit more than cost now that they're producing more. And that number is going to keep increasing. But I think as we get towards the end of, say, 76, I will design an update to this car. Uh, but I will probably leave that for the next video. So we'll, we'll leave this one here. And this is basically like a very rough guide without too much explanation on the specifics of how to get started with a sports car company. And this will get you well on your way. As you can see, we're already starting to make a profit here and it's off of our first car. So we haven't, we haven't even had the need to create a, uh, a second model, but uh, we'll look into that for the next one. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you do like these videos, you'd like to see more on automation, uh, just uh, comment below and mention that because I'm still sort of figuring out which specific videos I want to focus on. Um, but yeah, I'll see you for the next one.